Zurich uh, and Grenoble and has been working at NCAR, uh, having previously worked at the Swiss uh, Federal Institute uh, for Forest, Snow and Landscape Research. So plenty uh, of interesting uh, material to inspire us. Um, I'm going to, without further ado, hand over to, to Manuela um, and we all uh, very much look forward to hearing uh, her, your presentation. Thank you very much, Simon, and welcome everyone to this talk. And thank you for having me uh, for this seminar within the Oxford Water Network. Today, I'd like to talk about regional flooding in the United States. And to start this off, I'm going to take you back to the year 2005, when a pretty severe and a pretty widespread flood event hit Switzerland. That flood event caused damages worth millions of dollars by affecting housing, infrastructure, and also business operation. After such severe events, we are usually interested in two questions. One of them is how often are such events gonna happen in future? And the second is how severe or how widespread are they likely gonna be? In the very simplest setting, we're going to answer these types of questions by using a frequency analysis on the observations, streamflow observations at one particular catchment or at one particular gauge location. In that case, we're interested in a single site and ideally we have some streamflow observations for that site. From that time series, which might span 30 to 100 years, depending on the kind of setting or also the country, we might extract a set of flood events using either an annual maxima approach or a peak over threshold approach. Based on the extracted flood events or the flood sample, we're going to establish a relationship between the magnitude of an event and its frequency or return period. And to do that, we take our flood sample, we fit a theoretical distribution to it, and that theoretical distribution then tells us for a specific magnitude what kind of frequency or return period that event is going to have. Or the other way around, we're going to ask, what magnitude does an event of, let's say, a return period of 100 years have? That means we're interested in a, an event that occurs on average every 100 years, and we're going to determine the corresponding magnitude. Now, life is unfortunately never that easy, and floods are not necessarily local phenomena. They can affect a white wide region or a large region, depending on the type of precipitation event that triggers the flood event and also depending on the type of antecedent conditions we have prior to the precipitation triggering flood event. In that case, our flood event might not affect just one single site or one single catchment, but instead it might affect a whole region. And in that case, this relationship between magnitude and frequency becomes a bit more complicated because all of a sudden we are no longer in a univariate setting, but rather we are in a multivariate setting. And still in that multivariate setting, we might want to break down our question to kind of a univariate relationship by considering instead of just peak magnitude of an event, something like regional flood extent or spatial flood extent. In any case, whether we are in this univariate or multivariate setting, we might struggle with the limited length of our records. Because especially these regional events, they're going to be very rare. We're, we have observed very few of them. And just based on the observation, it's going to be very difficult for us to establish this relationship between magnitude and frequency. So what we would typically do in order to still look at these rare events is find some way of increasing the sample size. And one way of increasing such a sample size is by using a stochastic model. 
That stochastic model allows us to get a better idea of the variability inherent in a phenomena by simulating very long time series of events that go much beyond what we've seen in our records. And using such a stochastic model will therefore allow us to look at very rare events such as regional flood events. In this talk, I would like to focus on regional flooding. So we look at everything that does not just affect one single catchment, but multiple regions or multiple catchments. In the talk, I would like to address three main topics. First, we would like to understand what spatial flood dependencies look like. That means we want to understand which regions or which catchments are potentially connected during flood occurrence. In order to look at such space, uh, spatial flood connectedness or spatial flood dependencies, we're going to use a set of 671 natural catchments in the United States. That's basically the catchments you see displayed on this map. We're going to focus on natural catchments because we want to understand the natural processes behind spatial flood dependencies. That means we're going to ignore water management or reservoir operation effects on sp uh, spatial flood dependencies. In a second step, we're trying to model these spatial flood dependencies. I'm going to propose a stochastic model that allows us to generate spatially consistent flood event sets over the United States and in other parts of the world. And then in a third part of the talk, we're going to take these stochastically simulated flood event sets to estimate regional flood probabilities. So we're going to ask the question of how likely is it that one of the regions you say this, see displayed on this map is going to be affected by widespread flooding. And answering these types of questions is really just possible because we increase the sample size beyond what we have seen in the observations. I'd like to start now by first better understanding what spatial flood dependencies look like and how they vary in space and also in time. For that first part of the analysis, we are going to use this set of 670 catchments in the conterminous United States, as I've mentioned previously. So for each of the catchments in the data set, we're going to apply a peak over threshold approach in order to identify flood events for each of the catchments in the data set. And how this works is that we set a threshold, that's the red line here, and everything that lies above that line is going to be defined as a flood event. And these are the, the uh, brown points. Now, as we're not just interested in flooding at one single location, we're going to take this to a regional setting by identifying all the flood events that affect at least one of the stations in the data set. And for each of the overall events, we're now going to determine for each of the catchments whether it was affected by that particular event. So let's have a closer look at that matrix. That matrix tells us for each event E and for each catchment C, whether that catchment was affected by that particular flood event. If it was affected by the flood event, it gets an entry of one. If it was unaffected by a certain flood event, it gets an entry of zero. And we do that for each catchment and each overall flood event. Using that binary occurrence matrix, we can now determine which of the catchments potentially co-experience flood events or which of the catchments have co-experienced flood events within a certain window of time in, in, the, in the past period. And we can use that information to map spatial flood dependencies. So what do you see here now plotted are again the 671 catchments in gray. 
and the catchments or some of the catchments are connected by black lines. So whenever two catchments are connected by a black line, that means that these two catchments have co-experienced flooding in the past. That means they've around the same time experienced a flood event. When we have a closer look at that map, we see that there is certain regional clusters of high flood connectedness. We see that spatial flood dependencies or spatial flood connectedness is pretty high along the west coast. We also see it's high in the Rocky Mountains. It's high in the Appalachian Mountains and here west of the Appalachian Mountains. And then we see some smaller clusters in Florida and in Texas. Now, this picture is for all the seasons combined. And as we all well know, is that different regions have different types of flood seasonality. So also these spatial flood connectedness patterns, they may vary by season. In order to look at that, we're gonna look at the mean flood seasonality of a certain catchment. The color of the dots now indicates for each catchment when its mean flood season is happening. So whenever your dot is bluish, that means that mean flood seasonality is in winter or spring. Whenever the dot is pinkish or purplish, that means that mean flood seasonality of that catchment is sometime in late spring or summer. And whenever the color of your dot is orange, that means that mean flood seasonality is happening sometime in fall. And we see again that there is a, a pretty distinct pattern in terms of flood seasonality over the United States, with mean flood seasonality happening in, in winter and early spring along the West Coast, in late spring or early summer in the Rocky Mountains, also in summer and, and late spring in the Great Plains, and then we have a pretty pronounced flood seasonality also in the Appalachian Mountains, where most of the flood events happen in winter or early spring. It then may be interesting for us later on is that flood seasonality in Texas and also in Florida is mainly uh, concentrated around um, late summer and fall due to some um, tropical cyclone activity. Now let's look at the different seasons and what spatial flood connectedness looks by season. We're going to start with winter and the winter maps shows us that there's pretty high spatial flood connectedness along the west coast with some connections re reaching inland. We think that's because of inland penetrating atmospheric rivers. And then we also see pretty high flood connectedness in the Appalachian Mountains and west of them. As we move into spring, we see that the spatial flood connectedness patterns and um, pattern changes. We lose spatial flood connectedness here in the Pacific Northwest and along the West Coast while we gain a lot of spatial flood connectedness in the Rocky Mountains, some in the Great Plains, and we maintain spatial flood connectedness in the Appalachian Mountains. As we move into summer, we lose most of the flood connectedness, but we see that there's one region which has pretty high flood connectedness, and these are the Rocky Mountains, and that's caused by snowmelt contributions that synchronized flood occurrence across the different catchments located in the Rocky Mountains. And then we move even later into the year, into fall, and we see that almost all the spatial flood connectedness is gone, which means that there's still occasionally local flood occurrence, but it's hardly ever larger um, widespread flood events. And we see that there's still some spatial flood connectedness left or again growing up because of atmospheric rivers here in the Pacific Northwest. We have some interesting activity here in Texas and Florida due to tropical cyclones. And then we also have 
um, increasing spatial flock connectedness again here in the northeast. So the takeaway here is essentially that spatial flood dependencies vary A, regionally, and B, seasonally. And we now want to better understand why these seasonal variations happen and how they're shaped by spatial dependencies in precipitation or whether we need additional land surface processes such as snow melt and soil moisture in order to actually explain the spatial dependencies we see in flooding. To better understand these spatial flood dependencies, we're going to compare spatial flood dependency in, in flooding. That's a summary of what we've seen before, and this time I'm no longer displaying the black lines, but instead the size of the dot tells you something about how many catchments that particular catchment is connected to. So the larger the dot, the more connections to other catchments that catchment has during um, flood periods. We're going to focus on the winter and summer season because they're so nicely distinct. Now we're going to do essentially the same thing for extreme precipitation. So we're no longer mapping spatial flood dependencies, but instead we're mapping spatial extreme precipitation dependencies during the dates of flood occurrence. And that's what the spatial patterns look like. And you might see some similarities to the patterns we see for spatial flood dependencies. However, there's also um, some pretty distinct differences, especially here in the mountains, where we either have more spatial precipitation dependency than spatial flood dependency, or we have less spatial precipitation dependency than spatial flood dependency. So we're going to look at the differences between the two maps, which means that we're taking the red pattern and we are from it just subtracting the blue pattern, which leaves us with green colors in areas where spatial flood connectedness is higher than spatial precipitation connectedness, and it leaves us with purple patterns in area where spatial precipitation connectedness is higher than spatial flood connectedness. And these maps are essentially going to Kind of explain us what's happening or when we actually need more than just precipitation connectedness to in order to explain spatial flood connectedness. So here in the in the west and in the east we have space in more spatial flood connectedness than spatial precipitation connectedness, which means that we need some soil moisture high soil moisture that essentially leads to a direct translation of precipitation in, into flooding and thereby intensif and intensifies the synchronization of events across catchments. In contrast, here in the Rocky Mountains, we have, we, we lose spatial connectedness as we move from precipitation to flooding, which means that the connectedness is lost due to snow accumulation because, as you can imagine, snow accumulates and direct runoff formation is delayed. And we're also only going to see that runoff formation later in the year. And that's exactly why we see this opposite effect in summer, where we now have higher spatial flood connectedness in the Rocky Mountains than higher precipitation connectedness. And that's because of these snowmelt contributions that increase um, spatial flood connectedness because events are synchronized due to snow melt across the different catchments. And basically, again, the opposite is happening in, in the Appalachian Mountains, for example, where soils are, are pretty dry and, and the spatial connectedness we see in precipitation is not directly translated into spatial flood connectedness. So from that first part of the analysis, we take away that spatial flood dependencies vary regionally and they also vary seasonally due to differences in, in um, flood seasonality. And then we've also seen that spatial connectedness in precipitation is not sufficient to explain spatial 
flock connectedness and we need additional land surface processes such as snow melt and soil moisture in order to explain the spatial flock connectedness patterns we actually observe. So now we're going to move away from more the process understanding side towards the modeling side. And we want to come up with an approach that allows us to model these spatial dependencies within a stochastic modeling framework. So the goal here is really, as I mentioned in the beginning, to have a model we can run in order to generate as many spatially consistent flood event sets as we wish. So that stochastic model is supposed to represent A, the distribution of flow at individual locations. Then it's supposed to model the temporal pattern of flow. And it's also supposed to model the spatial dependencies of flooding across different stations. The model I'm proposing here is called PRSIM wave, which stays for, which represents phase randomization simulation based on wavelets. So it uses kind of an empirical temporal model in combination with a theoretical distribution in order to simulate spatially consistent continuous stream flow time series from which we can later on extract spatially consistent flood event sets. And I'd like in the next slide to explain you a bit more in detail how that model works. So the input to that model are observed stream flow time series, continuous stream flow time series, and we are here again going to work with the 671 stations of natural um, stream flow. For each of these catchments, we're in a first step going to model the distribution of flow at an individual location. In order to do that, we use the four parameter kappa distribution, which is a very flexible distribution because of its four parameters and allows us to model daily flow pretty well in a, in a wide range of climatological and hydrological settings. Once we've gotten the distribution right, we want to make sure that we also get the temporal pattern. So that means the temporal autocorrelation pattern right. In order to do that, we use kind of an empirical approach that transforms our time domain time series into a time frequency space by using the wavelet transform. The wavelet transform decomposes our time series into two types of components, among which one is an amplitude component that tells us something about the intensity of the signal at different time scales. And then the other part of the signal is the phase information, which tells us something about the temporal shift of the signal in time. And we're now going to use that amplitude information of our observations to preserve the temporal autocorrelation information in our observations. And then as a third component, we need a spatial model, and that spatial model is also empirical. That means we use a simulated white noise time series and we use the same time series over all the catchments. That's actually essential in order to maintain the spatial correlation. We decompose that white noise time series as we decompose the observations to also obtain some amplitude information, which we're not going to use, and some phase information. And now essentially what we do to introduce the stochasticity is we delete this observed phase information and combine our observed amplitude information with our stochastic um, phases or our random phases. And in doing so, we obtain a signal that shares the same temporal and spatial characteristics as our observations, just that it's a stochastic 
series which has slightly different statistical characteristics as our observations, but is still close enough to tell us something about the var variability of our phenomenon. Now in the last step, we want to apply our distribution, which helps us to back transform our, our new signal to the distribution we would like it to have. And we just do that because we want to use a theoretical distribution in order to generate events that go beyond the events that we've seen in the observations. So now you might think, oh, that looks a bit complicated and I don't really know whether that works. And I want to actually show you a few plots to convince you that the, you can actually trust the model. So what we do is we take that model, we run it a hundred times and we generate a hundred sets of time series across all the different stations in the data set. And if we want to summarize each of these time series by its mean hydrograph, that's basically what we get. So that gray line, the light gray line is the observed mean annual hydrograph of an example station. And then we see a hundred realizations of mean annual hydrograph as obtained by running the model a hundred times. And we see that the stochastically simulated time series, they uh, lie around what we've observed, indicating that the model gets the seasonal signal right. We don't just want it to get the seasonal signal right, but we also want it to get the overall autocorrelation right. So what we do in order to assess that is we um, compare the observed autocorrelation function in light gray to 100 simulated autocorrelation functions in dark gray. And we also see there that there's pretty good correspondence between the observations and the simulations. So we conclude that our model gets the temporal signal right. In addition to the temporal signal, we wanted to get the distribution right. And I'm here just showing for one of the stations, the seasonal, the box plots of the seasonal distributions. And ideally, the median of the simulated and the observed distributions is pretty close, while we would be generating some more outliers for the simulations because the simulations are on many more times and produce many more um, events or many more days than we have in the observed series. As a last part, we also want to see whether the spatial dependencies are modeled right. And in order to do that, I want to just show you um, time series for different catchments in different regions. So I've chosen three regions with a different hydroclimate, one in the Pacific Northwest with, with um, pretty, pretty um, severe flooding. Then we have one in the in, in Texas, which is more a, a dry and convective events um, region. And then we have some more, uh, one more region here in the east with, with pretty high flows and also some snow melt contributions. And for each of these regions, I've now chosen four different example catchments as indicated by the different colors. And for each of these for catchments in each of the regions, I've plotted a time series of three years here to the left. So each color is one station within the region, and we see that within the region, the stations, they have a somewhat similar um, temporal behavior, uh, but it's not exactly the same. And we now wish that our simulations, they produce some patterns that look similar, but they also look um, slightly different because it's a stochastic model that's not supposed to produce exactly what we've seen in the observations. And these are now three years of simulations, and we see these simulations, they look different than what we had in the observations, but they still look similar enough that we see that the model is doing something right. It's producing a signal that looks plausible and that has the same characteristics as our observations. So we're now using that model 
to simulate some very long time series of events, among which we're going to identify flood events. If we do that, that's essentially what we get. So we we take all the time series of all the catchments simulated using the model, and we again identify peak over threshold events within these time series. And this little animation just shows, gives you an impression of the spatial events we would be producing. All of these um, should be spatially consistent with, with the observations, but they're events which we haven't observed yet. So using that model really helps us to increase the sample size from a few spatial events to a hundreds or a thousands of spatial flood events. If you're interested in producing stochastic time series for your own catchment of interest, then I'd like to point you to our R package, which is called PRSIM. You can find it on the CRAN webpage, and you're, you're very much invited to download it and to start experimenting it if you'd like to generate your own stochastic time series for your own catchment. The only thing you need as an input is really observed daily stream flow time series. Now, knowing that that model does something right and produces spatially consistent flood event sets, we're going to use these flood event sets in order to look at the regional probability of flooding. So we're going to ask the question of how likely is it that a certain number of catchments within a particular region are jointly fl flooded? Or asked differently, where we want to know how likely is it that there's widespread flooding within a certain region? In order to answer questions like that, we're going to use a similar approach as we used in the first part of the analysis when we looked at the spatial flood connectedness pattern. But this time we're no longer using observations, but instead we use the stochastic simulations from um, PRSIM. So we have a very long time series of continuous stream flow for each of the 670 catchments in our data set. And we're using these stochastic series to again extract flood events. And as in the beginning, we use a peak over threshold approach to do that. We again are interested in regional flood events instead of just local flood events. So we're again going to collect all the flood events happening in any of the catchments. And we are going to summarize the results again in a binary occurrence matrix that tells us for each of the catchments and for each of the events by which events the catchment was affected by. And using that information, we're then going to perform a regional hazard assessment that answers the question of how likely is it that 70% of the catchments within a particular region are jointly flooded. And of course, this number of 70% might seem a bit arbitrary, but we chose 70% in order to have a number that indicates widespread flooding. So a large number of the catchments within a, a region is actually flooded and to do that with any other number you might be interested in. So for that regional hazard assessment, we're going to use two types of um, region or basin definitions. The first of these definitions uses these 18 large river basins in the United States that are aligned with topography and follow the major river network. And then in the second part, we're going to take a more local perspective to regional flooding, which means that we're for, for each catchment here indicated in red, going to define its own region. And that region is defined as all the catchments lying within a certain radius uh, around that catchment. So for each catchment, we have one region that contains all, all the catchments basically around it. 
And I, I first want to show you the results for the regional assessment. So for that regional assessment, we attribute each of the 670 catchments to one of the 18 large river basins you see displayed here. And then we want to know how probable it is that 70% of all the catchments within that basin are actually jointly flooded. And I, I also want to remind you here that we're using with working with natural flow. So this is the probability of natural basins being jointly flooded, ignoring the role that um, river management or reservoir management might potentially play. We here see a map that shows you how likely it is that 70% of the catchments within one of these regions are jointly flooded. And we look at all the seasons combined. And if the color of your basin is darker red, that means that the probability of widespread flooding is higher than in a catchment where we have lighter colors. And we see here, as in the beginning, as um, we already got the impression when we looked at the spatial flood connectedness maps, that there's some uh, pretty distinct regional differences in terms of regional flooding probabilities. So these regional flooding probabilities, this, they seem to be higher here along the west coast, where we'd already observed the higher um, flood connectedness. And also we'd seen that these catchments, they experience flooding in approximately the same season, which explains to us why they might be flooding at the same time, leading to a higher susceptibility to regional or widespread flooding. Then similarly here in the northeast, also these catchments, they have a similar um, flood seasonality and high flood connectedness, and therefore uh, a higher probability for widespread flooding than, for example, catchments here in the Columbia River Basin, where we have catchments combined that show very different types of flood seasonality with catchments in the upper part more dominated by, by snowmelt and catchments in the lower part more dominated by, by winter um, precipitation-driven flooding. And given that these processes are so different, it's, it's more unlikely that a large percentage of the catchments within that basin is jointly flooded and therefore we see a higher or a lower probability for a widespread or regional flooding. Because we've initially seen that spatial flood dependencies vary by season, we want to look at the probability of regional flooding for different seasons. We see that overall the probability for widespread flooding is clearly highest in spring. Again, that's not surprising given that we now know that spatial flood dependencies are highest in that season. And it's also not surprising that um, fall has the lowest probabilities for widespread flooding because we'd seen that only very few regions show um, flood connectedness during that season. And some of you now might might say, oh, well, it's a bit surprising to me that, um, for example, Columbia River Basin has such a, a low um, probability for regional flooding. That's exactly because we're subdividing the space as along the river basin or along um, topography, which leads to a subdivision that combines catchments with un inhomogeneous flood producing processes that will lead to flood occurrence during different periods of the year. And that explains why regional uh, flood probabilities are pretty low in, in such a basin. So in order to understand a bit more where flood dependencies are high or regional flood probabilities are high if we don't subdivide space into these river basins, we took this second perspective, the local perspective. And I want to remind you that in that local perspective analysis, we define one region, 
per catchment and that region is is basically the radius everything within the radius around uh, that specific catchment and the question is there how likely is it that 70 percent of all the catchments within that radius are jointly flooded and the color you see indicated here now on the map tells you something about probability that the the radius or the region around that catchment is affected by widespread flooding. We again see some interesting spatial pictures which now align even better with the spatial flood dependency maps we've seen in the beginning. So we see that it's it's likely or not likely, it's still a rare event, but it's it's more likely than in other parts that the catchments at the west coast are jointly flooded or also the catchments in the northeast. And then we see something which we hadn't seen previously in the regional perspective analysis, that if we are in spring and there are snowmelt contributions, actually the risk that all these catchments in the Rocky Mountain region are jointly affected is, is also pretty high. We see the same thing here uh, during the summer months. And we see similar patterns here in the northeast, um, in in the Paci or in the Pacific Northwest, due to atmospheric river activity. So the conclusion from this regional hazard analysis is really that your results depend a lot in on how you define your regions, because it's important not just when events happen within that region; it's also important that they they happen um, at roughly the same time of the year in order to achieve some synchronization. And if you have a very inhomogeneous region such as the Columbia River Basin, you might end up with pretty low probabilities of regional flooding. Or in other words, if you have a catchment with homogeneous flood producing processes, then the probability of regional or widespread flooding is much larger. I would like to wrap up my talk by summarizing the most important findings. So we've learned that spatial flood dependencies vary both in time and in space, and that they're shaped both by meteorological and land surface processes. Then we get to know the hydro or the stochastic model PRSIM, which produces spatially consistent flood event sets and also spatially consistent continuous stream flow time series. And you're very warmly invited to experiment with the R package associated to the stochastic model. And then in the last part of the analysis, we've seen that there are some regions with higher probabilities for widespread flooding than others, which is related to the homogeneity of or inhomogeneity of flood producing processes within a certain region. I am now very much looking forward to your questions, and I hope that I could show you that the regional dimension of flooding is actually not just interesting, but it's it's important because these types of events, they're much more challenging to handle in terms of flood management. And then I also want you to encourage to continue the discussion once we're um, through this hour. If you have any topic to discuss related to regional flooding or um, flood frequency analysis, um, please reach out and I'm happy to discuss more questions and ideas during uh, a, a call or a coffee chat. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, Great. Thank you very much indeed, Manuela.